say that we, Claire, you can stop the recording uh, just because we'll get started. Welcome to Courageous Parents Network's uh, monthly in the room Zoom meeting for families and clinicians caring for seriously ill children. Today's topic is the role of the primary care pediatrician in the family journey. And we um, gave it this subtitle, is your pediatrician your child's quarterback or the quarterback of your child's care journey? Because uh, while I'm honestly not a fan of football, I do know what a central role the quarterback plays in facilitating the game and moving the game forward down the field. And the, uh, at least in my experience, the primary care pediatrician uh, plays a, can play, and if you're lucky, will play a very pivotal role in your care journey with your child. And it is our hope at Courageous Parents Network that the primary care pediatrician be that person in your life, whether they may not be your child's primary um, care uh, clinician because your child may have conditions um, like neurological conditions or pulmonology, pul um, pulmonary conditions that are so acute that their primary care person will be a specialist, but always you, we hope that the pediatrician will be alongside as a core part of the team. I will say then in the case of my daughter, Cameron, she did have one other specialist, a neurologist to help manage her seizures, but we only saw that neurologist and she was wonderful three times in Cameron's two years and all of the other care was provided for by uh, her primary care pediatrician who did all, all the advanced care planning and everything with Cameron and made it possible in our case for our daughter to die peacefully and comfortably at home. And for us, that made a huge difference. So this topic is very near and dear to my heart. And I am, it's perhaps been many years coming that we should have a Zoom event. And we are very lucky to have with us three pairs of parents of children living with or who had serious conditions and their primary care pediatrician. And without further ado, I will invite each of these parents to introduce themselves and their child, tell a short blip about their child and their, their family story, and then we'll begin the conversation. So let us start with you, Sam and Roman. If you could introduce yourselves, tell us about your son and um, his pediatrician. Yep. So my name's Sam. This is my husband, Roman. Um, our son was Atticus. Um, he was diagnosed with T-Sachs disease. Um, he passed away last year, actually, on Valentine's Day. So we kind of had his anniversary and everything fairly recently. Um, his primary care is Dr. Kaufman, um, who's joining us today. Um, and she was kind of just our miracle worker with him. Um, she helped a lot with the diagnosis process from wondering why he had hypotonia and wasn't hitting his milestones. And uh, she really, really helped us fight to get answers and kind of help push the ball forward. So, you know, we could make the most of the time we had with him and, and do what we need to do to get him the best care while we had our time with him. Thank you, Sam and Roman. And I want to acknowledge, I, I, I forgot that, that Monday was the anniversary of Atticus's death. And so thank you for being here. So in such a fresh place, I hope that actually this feels meaningful. In, it in does. I am very much on the side of trying to advocate and just do what I can for him. So good. And we'll hear we'll, we'll hear some more about that. Sarah, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Sarah, and um, my daughter Emerson had type two Gaucher's disease, and she was our first child, um, and she died in 2016 at 16 months old. And our pediatrician was Dr. Meredith Monahan. It's here. Um, and we actually um, had just moved across the country. So it was an interesting way to meet. Um, I had been getting increasingly worried something was wrong with our daughter, but everyone was saying she was okay. And by the time we met Dr. Monahan, she was almost eight months old and she definitely had something going on. And so it was that visit that sent us into the, the journey of getting the diagnosis and what all that meant. And um, so, yeah, we met on that day and then she helped us all along throughout our daughter's life, like 
um, they were just saying about kind of helped us have her have the best life she could in the time she had. Mm -hmm. And you continue to have a relationship with Dr. Moynihan, right? Yes, yes. She's become a good friend of ours and we have a healthy two-year-old and she's um, our second daughter's um, pediatrician as well, which is really nice. Yeah, that continuing connection through your other children can be very meaningful. Yeah. Um, all right, Kirsten. Good afternoon. I'm Kirsten Isgro calling in from Burlington, Vermont, and my superhuman team is Christy Trask and Jill Reinhardt. It, they're part of the University of Vermont Medical Center. And I have a different trajectory in terms of landing into um, my care with Christy and Jill in that uh, my daughter, I have 16 year old twin daughters that just turned 16. And I moved back up to Burlington, Vermont with a diagnosis that one of my daughters had a rare disease, neurological disease under the leukodystrophy category called Crab A. So we had gotten the diagnosis when we were in Western Massachusetts and we basically moved back to Burlington with the intent that our daughter was gonna die soon because 90% of the kids that have this disease are gone by the time they're three or four years old. And we wanted to be with near friends. Um, and I have a good friend of mine who's a general practitioner because I have a certain number of a level of social currency. She highly recommended Jill Reinhardt's practice, particularly for medically complicated children and um, families dealing with disabilities. So there was a lot of um, very good, both planning on uh, and just having a really solid network of folks that led me to, to Jill and Christy. Um, it's not lost on me that I am still in Burlington and my daughter is 16 and um, and she's a total outlier of her disease. And so Jill and Christy and I have been making it up as we go along. Mm -hmm. And which is, I think a really important point, which is that uh, Jill, Jill and Christy have been willing to wade into uncharted territories with you um, because nobody goes into primary care pediatrics thinking that you're going to take care of a child who will not live into adulthood because that is not the job of primary care pediatrics. Um, and yet this is what happens to, uh, uh, it's not typical in a practice, but it can happen. And we know what a huge difference it makes when the pediatrician says, this is not what I signed up for, but I, I will hang in there with you and do this with you. Um, so on that note, uh, well, I just wanna say for those clinicians and parents who have joined us, we will be opening it up at the end for questions and answers. You can put your observations or questions into the chat. We will tend to all of that and there will be an opportunity for you to ask and we may ask you a question, um, but first we're gonna hear from the parents and doctors here. Uh, so uh, let's start, Sam and Roman. Um, what was the most uh, important, what would you say are the two, two or three most important things that Dr. Kaufman did for you with Atticus and during Atticus's life? I think the most important thing is that she just took all of our concerns seriously. Um, he started off um, normal and we didn't really have any concerns when he was born. Um, and about two months of age, he started to not meet his milestones. And we went in and had some concerns and a lot of family and friends kind of uh, made Shut it seem- us off. <laughs> yeah, made it seem like we were crazy. He was our first and only son. Um, so we just made some like, new parent concerns and um, we really had to kind of fight initially to get anyone to take us seriously. But Dr. Kaufman from the get go, um, always you know, treated our concerns as valid and, and really fought hard to help get us answers. Um, yeah, immediately she knew that he was floppy, had hypotonia, and from there she worked very hard to send out referrals and 
just she wanted answers just as much as we did she didn't you know just shrug us off and be like oh we'll see how he does in time like she didn't like that you know he wasn't hitting milestones um so she sent out referrals and another important thing for us is like one of the first neurologists we saw he basically picked up my baby said yep he's floppy and he was already regressing it's like come see me in a few months if he gets worse I was like okay and so she did not like that answer and so she went out and made sure we got a second opinion so she took the time to make sure that we did get answers and didn't just you know take the first opinion and roll with it and even once we were established with a very well-known uh, neurologist she still was sending out referrals for cardiology eyes um, stuff like that just to make sure we weren't missing anything in our eye appointments actually what got us our answer because all his testing and stuff was good otherwise so it just it worked out very nicely and she stayed in communication with us through the whole journey to just make sure we were doing okay and that we got our answers and I think that helped a lot she had amazing communication with all of his numerous specialists that he ended up seeing and um, I mean she was in constant communication with them keeping track of our son's case and what was going on and with us as well um, there were a handful of times where we heard about test results from from her before we actually heard from the specialists um, at the University of Iowa a whole separate facility than where she works um, she was just so involved in his care um, and she did a lot to try and take care of us too as parents she connected us with a lot of resources and kind of let us know what was available to us and so I know I said we were going to do parents first and then pediatricians, but I'm actually going to switch it up. Um, Dr. Kaufman, uh, listening to what um, Sam and Roman have said, how, um, how was that for you? What did it take for you to, to advocate on behalf of them and Atticus? It was a new, ex well, uh, advocating wasn't a new experience, but the type of advocation that I had to do for him was uh, new for me because uh, I had recently, well, I was in practice for a couple of years um, out of residency, and uh, it was just new to have to uh, maybe challenge um, some subspecialists a little bit and maybe question their um, evaluations and go towards um, other avenues, maybe uh, thinking of things in a different way than maybe those subspecialists were and uh, asking them, hey, what about this? What about this? And they're somewhere like, sure, do what, you know, go ahead and pursue that. And we're open to it. And um, just realizing that we weren't getting any answers from the normal tests and normal things that we did and having to realize that, hey, you know, ultimately it's, He's, he's my responsibility. I need to, you know, help him out and make sure he gets the care that he needs. And I need to think in a different way about this. And um, I, that ultimately led to having him be seen by the ophthalmologist and um, getting our answer when the other tests wouldn't give us that answer, so. Um, and when he was diagnosed with Tay-Sachs, was there, did you have a moment where you were like, I don't know, I don't know Tay Sachs. I can't do this. <laughs> um, it it was more a moment, you know. I I don't know Tay Sachs well, and I need to find more out about it and talking to other doctors. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly not something that you come across, you know, frequently. It's very rare. Um, so finding out more. And then um, when uh, you're in residency, uh, you do see a lot of children with life limiting illnesses. Um, and we, I did do a palliative care rotation through residency, but it's not always part of residency. Um, and, but it was very helpful to me to reflect on that and to know those physicians at the University of Iowa where um, he saw the palliative care physicians to know them um, fairly well and be able to talk to them about him. Um, and mm -hmm. that, you know, knowing um, their knowledge of it and knowing his um, neuromuscular specialist knowledge of it uh, 
and just learning more about it that way. It's kind of one of those things you have to take responsibility and um, decide you're going to learn more about it because yeah. you have to take care of this person with it. Mm -hmm. But luckily, he had a great team of people who were very uh, knowledgeable about it. So um, I'll probably have the same question for you, Meredith. But first, Sarah, if you, what would you say are some of the most important ways that um, Dr. Monahan helped you with Emerson, you and Steve with Emerson? Um, I would echo everything that was just said about the care coordination, about the talking to different specialists, um, and just all that whole piece of it was huge for us. I think that, you know, we, even though we have some medical people in our family, we didn't know anything about the medical system and we were new parents. And then we were thrown into this medical system that we had no idea what to do or how to navigate it. And so I think that, um, and then we have this diagnosis that's just awful. And it just, it was so much to take in at once. So to have somebody that could coordinate all the pieces of all the different specialists and even things like, yeah, like getting our results and having her, or there are results, but just different um, sort of, um, you know, we'd have Emerson meet with pulmonology, but then Dr. Monahan would talk about it with us after and kind of just go over what had happened to make sure we understood what was happening. Um, and any appointments we had to have, she always coordinated those. So that care coordination piece and helping us just navigate the system initially and understand the different parts of it was really helpful. And then I think just helping us um, anticipate what was coming because we did not, I mean, the, the disease trajectory can be variable anyway. And so we couldn't really get an answer exactly how this was gonna go for Emerson and what it was gonna look like. But there are some things that are pretty um, universal with this um, diagnosis as far as um, different interventions you're gonna have to think about or um, that sort of stuff that comes down the line. And so helping us anticipate that stuff and think about it ahead of time. I think, um, you know, I always, I say this to her all the time, but I feel like it was like, just her timing was so good with it. Like it was never ahead of where we were, but it was always, or maybe ahead had just enough that we didn't feel overwhelmed by taking on the next step or thinking about the next thing that might come down as, cause her disease um, was degenerative. So things were gonna go downhill. Um, but we were never so far ahead that we couldn't take it on, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like the biggest thing in the end was that we were never making decisions in a time of crisis. We were making all those decisions ahead of time and in a way that felt um, sort of we could really think and we could really make decisions that were right for our family and right for our daughter. Um, so when there was a crisis, we weren't reacting entirely in that moment. Um, so yeah, I think just the care coordination and the helping guiding us as we anticipated what was coming were the biggest things. Dr. Monahan, how did you, um, had you ever had a patient like Emerson before? Had you ever done this sort of anticipatory guidance for a life limiting condition with parents before? training, preparation, and then the time it takes to, to care for a child like this, it's not, it's more than most. And how did you make room for that in your practice? So, um, so I was fortunate to at least have had some exposure to chronic illness through residency, um, uh, not as much palliative care, but through our Hemonc clinic. Um, so I had worked closely with families and trained under Jill Reinhardt, who's down in the little box in there, you'll hear from her soon. So, um, so I, I did have some of that, but this was really um, in practice, this was, was really um, on my, in my own private practice that I'm in. Um, so it, it was, it's very different and it's different anyway. It doesn't matter whether it had been in practice uh, uh, by myself as well. It's gonna be a different journey for every family and, and for, for me with every family. Um, and I think um, the, the most important part for me, I, I wanna echo what Catherine said was like saying, okay, now I gotta learn more. I gotta figure this out. And, um, and use the specialist information, follow up with them before I meet with Sarah and Steve and Emerson to be able to feel as educated and able to answer questions as I can. 
we talked a little bit before about the fact that we had set, we set aside times. We just planned times. I think that helped us not to feel like our meetings were going to be always in a crisis or a worry time, um, but uh, set, set sort of, I don't know if it was monthly or every few weeks, but at least every month we were meeting together um, to try and offload some of that um, and, and just regroup um, so that we can hopefully anticipate um, what was going to be needed next. Mm -hmm. And did what, um, how many people are in your practice? How many clinicians? There are six of us now. And did you have to tell them about Emerson if there were instances where you were not on call? Because I think yes. that's part of- Yes, all of our complex um, care patients. We do uh, two times a month, we do a peer review and it comes up. Then we often will review um, patients that have more going on at the time or um, new diagnoses, um, just so everybody's aware where we'll send out information um, so that anybody who's on call is aware. Um, and it's also, you had sort of asked you what were some other ways to build the muscle around this, but um, is, is having those colleagues in order to um, talk to and say, okay, this is really hard and um, I need some support. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How can I, how can I not only have more energy to come back to it, but have most uh, or best support um, the family? Thank you. All right, Kirsten. You've been doing this for 16 years. Uh, how, what would you say are, what have been sort of the, the highlights or the, the things that have really stood out for you in your, in your relationship with Christy and Jill and ha having them either lead you or accompany you and well, I, I first want to just echo what the other two families said. I think when a, a family does get a diagnosis, per, for, partly the, the diagnostic journey can be very long. Um, and as I said, I landed in, into Jill and Christie's lap with that diagnosis. So, um, but there's a huge learning curve uh, in terms of being thrust into the a world that you, one, as a parent, never assumed that you would be thrust into. But then we've got these really, really complicated systems. We've got complicated healthcare systems. We have complicated um, nursing care systems or lack thereof of in-home nursing care as in the case in Vermont where we have a serious workforce shortage. Um, so I think for, for me, as, as, you know, the care coordination is so incredibly key and I can't stress that enough. Um, and I'm watching that on the other end of the life spectrum, having ushered my mom through dementia and dealing with an 85 year old aunt and having zero care coordination. Um, and none of the doctors know what the other doctors are doing. And I'm trying to navigate like this enormously ridiculous medical list from my aunt. Um, I don't, I have not had to do that because I have my, you know, Christy. <laughs> um, and and so I think the care coordination is incredibly important, but I think there's these, these other pieces. Um, and, and Jill, I'm, I'm only saying this because it's on your, your webpage, so it's public information, but Jill is the sister of um, siblings with disabilities. And that's been a really, really important piece for my, my neurotypical twin um, to just know that information and, um, and have Jill as her pediatrician also um, so that my daughters are going to the same doctor is really important. And then also having a little bit of a, a field of, of experience that Jill has been very um, willing to share. And I think that's been incredible. Um, I think there's some other pieces that have helped with our chronic uh, traumatic stress, I'm going to call it, um, referring back to another panel that you had had Blythe on, on this um, with Courageous Network, but this having a medical home and with that having quarterly meetings with care, um, the care team and that care team could be everything from school nurses to the pair educator to um, the physical therapist, occupational therapist. Um, those have been so incredibly helpful and I always have felt like Christy and Jill were on our side, and I hate to use this war metaphor, but I think sometimes there really are these unnecessary battles that we as parents have to take on. Um, 
in terms of care plans. And I um, have so appreciated that Christy and Jill sort of hold that, they hold a, a physical space as well as a psychic space um, to just kind of check in and, and sort of see how we're doing. Um, and, and there's two other sort of moments, if I can just express. One was bringing a bioethicist in to talk with me and my partner um, and it, I, I'm going to echo Sarah. It didn't. It didn't feel um, abrupt. It, it felt like, and part of that is just what I bring to the table is being really you, you're just dealing with the reality that you have a death sentence for your child. Um, and I definitely believe that the more planning you do now, the the clearer headed you can be when the time comes when the child dies. And so I really appreciated that. Um, and that's an ongoing conversation. I also don't feel like it's a one and done. And that's definitely been kind of the theme, I think, with Christy and Jill and I is that, you know, it's it's a shared decision making. We are, and Christy, we just had a conversation yesterday of like, okay, we didn't think we were going to have to do this because we didn't think Sylvia was still going to be alive. And well, she's 16. And so do we want to revisit what we had decided when she was five? Um, and so I love, I love that. I love that continuity that, and um, that has been incredibly important. And, and also lastly, I think just being able to articulate how incredibly dysfunctional and frustrating the healthcare system, the educational system, um, the in-home nursing care systems are, because that can feel incredibly isolating as a parent and, um, and honestly adding more stress and more trauma when those systems are not working. And, um, I am eternally grateful for, for Jill and Christy because this journey would be really, really different. And I, bas I basically have refused to leave until my daughter dies because I cannot imagine trying to reestablish or recreate something like this um, in another part of the country. Kirsten, thank you so much for that. Um, you just said there was so much meat in what you said, but in that last piece, uh, we spoke, Courageous Parents Network spoke last year with a mom whose daughter has um, been outliving her prognosis and is now, I think, four. And they're a military family, so they could be moved at any point. But the mom said, like, if we are moved, I would move, but if she started, my daughter started to go downhill, I would insist on coming back because I want all of the most difficult work to be done with this particular clinician who's helped us get to four. So that is like what, that's just the impact that this relationship and this particular type of care can have on, on giving parents the confidence to, to do this and you're not doing it alone. Like all three of, all four of you have talked about feeling like you're not doing it alone because of this alliance you have with your child's um, pediatrician and pediatric care team. So Christy, you're a care coordinator. Will you talk, you're the care coordinator that, that uh, Kirsten was talking about. How, how do you think about your work and the mandate and the sort of the, the nature of what you are called to do? Thank you. Um, I, I really look at myself as um, sort of the touch point in the practice for families and um, really just, I really just try to build relationships with families, get to know families and understand what their goals of care for their child are. And as, as Jill always says, just partner alongside them, not behind them, not in front of them, but beside them and walk through the journey with them. And Really, I mean, it's, you know, we as healthcare providers, I think, you know, our training tends to lead us to, okay, well, you know, if X, then Y, and if this, then that, but it's really about what families want and what their goals are and not necessarily what we think might be the, the best next step, but it's really about, um, about what's best for this family and for this child. And another nice part of my job is, not only caring for and and helping coordinate care for Sylvie, but Sylvie's twin. You know, usually it's a it's sort of a family affair, so to speak. And so I, you know, I also get to see, you know, what Sylvie's twin Uma is like and how she is and how this affects her and 
um, you really you really just get to to understand the family and the dynamics and what works and what doesn't work and what's helpful and what's not and just being able to have that relationship built on trust and um, you know and sort of mutual respect I think is really that's really what my job is it's you know the other stuff the coordinating care and calling people and making sure this is done and that's done and scheduling this appointment that you know that just that comes with the job but the meat and potatoes is the relational piece mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what the that's what we all that's what we remember that's what we care most about um dr reinhardt what but in your in your role as as a pediatrician and also as a medical educator what would you what do you what would you add to all of this yeah, well, I think it's it's good to remember too that we as pediatricians are humans too, and that we have 16 year relationships with families and uh, uh, with trajectories. And so um, it's important for us to have our mentors, for us to have colleagues to talk to about this. And as I train other pediatricians to do this, it's really about finding um, your team. Um, and I wouldn't be able to practice anywhere near where I can now without Christy um, being able to do the work of the relationship building when I'm not in the office. So that's hugely important. Um, and I, I think as this quarterback analogy um, and the team based uh, comes across, you know, my I see my job in instances like this as being sort of um, getting to know families so that when decisions have to be made at times when the feelings are high and emotions are high, I know the family well enough that I can help them make the decision they would make when those issues and emotions aren't being felt. And, um, and that I learned from the bioethicists that we had have had pair up with us. Um, and it's so important because in these 16 years or however many years of relationship building, it get pretty, you know, myopic and up close and you need someone um, uh, to help see the 50,000 foot view. Um, and that's, that's why pairing with um, a palliative care physician or an ethicist can be so helpful uh, in, the, in the journey. Can you say a little more about that? Like what, what does it mean to go from here to here? Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example of another patient I have who has passed away and I was uh, along with the family and you know, we knew that there was a shortened life expectancy, it wasn't a rare disease, but probably wasn't going to live to adulthood. And, you know, something happened and the kiddo needed a certain procedure over and over again. And I was like, okay, we'll just set them up for that procedure. And then they bump along, bump along. And then finally, we both, the family and I sort of stopped and said, well, why? Anyway, it was a time to bring in someone else to say, like, we're just doing the job, keeping things going, instead of saying, you know, is it worth doing this every four months, two months, one month? Um, and so, so helpful. Uh, and that's what I mean by seeing, you know, just being in the, just keep going um, phase. So uh, a physician who's really skilled at helping us with that. And we sat and had a discussion and so important. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that piece because like when you're down in the trenches, you're managing, 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 you're not necessarily asking questions or looking at patterns and winding up to say what is what are we really trying to do here and what is the bigger picture um so uh, yeah. and that of course is a job of palliative care always but most primary care pediatricians haven't had a lot of, much training in pal in the principles of palliative medicine although i think that's changing um are you uh jill in in you direct the residency program in Vermont is it's is is palliative care part of what they this med students get exposed to the residents yeah I think uh both levels I mean I know more about the residency level I think you know we live in a world now where children are living with the diseases that they didn't used to live so long with and so um these skills we're needing more and more um and, uh, and so with our residency program, we have a couple of opportunities where, um, where residents and faculty can practice having conversations with simulated patients. And, and you can try a language one way and get one reaction and try language another way. It's so important. And you, you talked about you know, building muscles. That's really what it is. It's feeling 
getting those words to feel comfortable coming off of your tongue and then having phrases in your head that you know elicit a positive response or we get information and, and can understand the feelings better. Um, it's just like any other uh, skill, it takes a lot of practice. So being able to practice in a safe place with, with guidance from skilled people um, is really, really helpful. It's still um, a work in progress in terms of, you know, palliative care programs are, uh, we're building one here at the university specifically for pediatrics, which we're really happy to be having, but we haven't had a pediatric specific one uh, up until, until recently. That's good news that, that you're building it. Um, Sam and Roman, you were very lucky um, that, I mean, I'm sorry, you were not, of course, lucky about Atticus's <laughs> having Tay-Sachs, so, but you were lucky that Dr. Kaufman was his pediatrician mm -hmm. and it could have been otherwise. We know of families whose pediatrician is not able or doesn't feel prepared or equipped to, to really do that and who refer to a specialist and sort of politely walk away, um, if not officially, um, functionally, walk away. Um, what would you say, I, I think you, I think you've told me that you're involved in several groups and mm -hmm. as advocate with other families whose children yeah. have conditions. What would you say to a family if they felt unsupported? Have you thought, you know, if they tell you, or have you heard from families that might not have functional, what they feel is a functional relationship right. with their kid's doctor? I feel like more often than not, um, especially in the tay sex community, I do know plenty of people who don't get the support they need and the doctors more or less just kind of brush it off and don't really fight for the kid. I just actually had a mom tell me the other day that her kid was having seizures, but because he's going to die anyways, that they didn't need to do medication. Um, and so I've heard some horror stories like that and just in disbelief. And when I do hear things, I definitely encourage to try second opinions. Like it doesn't hurt to reach out. Like you might like your regular doctor, but you also need them to fight for your child as well, especially if it's life or death. Like you need to keep them comfortable and just, even if you don't have a diagnosis yet, like it could be something serious. And, you know, in our case it was, and we got lucky that, you know, Dr. Kaufman did fight to get that um, diagnosis and everything. But yeah, it's just, it's really important. I think second opinions are a huge thing and find someone you like and just keep looking at the pain, but someone's going to listen cool. eventually. And the other thing to that too is when you are talking to your doctor or your specialists, um, I think just making sure that you as a parent are comfortable voicing your concerns yeah. and can kind of articulate them. Um, so, you know, do your research and like, like figure out what specifically you're, you're concerned about, not just, I uh, kind of worry me he's been acting different, but, you know, put a pinprick on what, on what your concerns are so you can help your doctor get to it. Cause you see your child every day and they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and just the more information that you give them, the better information you can get back as well. Yeah, and I guess I, I was, when he first was just told it was hypotonia, I joined, you know, a hypotonia support group and just reading a lot of the posts are just asking questions, just kind of compare and contrast your children. And then you kind of learn like, what specific test should I ask for? Cause you know, some doctors might not think that a certain test would be relevant to your case, but it very well could be like, for us, like we almost didn't go to our eye exam because we're like, well, what's that going to do? And I'm so happy we did, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that got us our answers. So just reaching out and really just advocating and just asking questions. The, um, I was thinking about the, what you said earlier about one doctor saying, yep, he's floppy. Um, mm -hmm. The diagnostic odyssey is always is often a piece of this nightmare phase for families, and um, we've heard a lot of parents observe, say that like they their pediatrician initially dismissed some mm -hmm. of the symptoms that the parents were describing 
because you're an over anxious parent, you're a, you're a nervous parent, you're a, it's okay, it's okay. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I bet it is really hard to be a pediatric, you know, a primary QB where you do have nervous first time parents who think their child is going to die in their crib on day four because you're just a nervous parent. I remember being that nervous parent. So how, is that how, parent? Do, you, <laughs> how do you as a pediatrician, I mean, I don't know if there's probably no easy answer to this, but like balance the the emotion, uh, learn how to read the emotions of the parents and what you're hearing them say and know how to differentiate between understandable anxiety based on nothing but but love for the child versus mother's intuition is or father's intuition is actually saying something is not right here. How do you do that? <laughs> Maybe I don't, uh, I'll just a minute. I think I, I, you do a lot of rechecking. <laughs> I do a lot of follow up. I do a lot of phone calls to say how is it going? What is you know? So even if I know their worry might be out of proportion to what my worry is at the moment. I know they know their child best. So, um, and the worry is still a, a problem, <laughs> you know? So unchecked anxiety in a parent is also problematic um, to parenting. So I think, you know, when you take it in that light, it's still something that needs to be addressed and, and checked in on. Mm. So. That's lovely. She great. The parent, the parent is also the patient. Actually, often the parent really is the patient. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Catherine, would you add anything to that? Um, well, first I just wanna I wanna just say that Sam and um, Roman are remarkable people and remarkable parents. Um, and never came across to me as overly, you know. <laughs> unreasonably anxious at all um uh, so you know sometimes there are red flags that come up on either history or exam that make it pretty easy to know oh yeah this is um something that we need to look further into um but I agree with Meredith sometimes it's just a lot of follow-up and a lot of reassuring yourself um, by seeing the child more often or calling the next day and um seeing what's going on um Sometimes there are other uh, things that, you know, people bring up concerns that are certainly very common um, and we can offer reassurance right away based on the exam. Um, and that happens a lot too. And hopefully that helps with that anxiety. That's just normal with being a first time parent. I was just gonna add that we have developmental screening and we do that at every well visit. and. Um, it isn't necessarily one of the strengths in primary care, and we've been doing a lot of quality improvement nationwide to improve rates of developmental screening, at least documenting that it's been mm -hmm. done. But the, one of the most effective tools that we have for developmental screening is called the PEDS questionnaire, and it simply asks parents, do you have a concern with how your baby moves, how they communicate, how they see, how they respond to the environment? And if the parents have a concern, that should be a red, that is a red flag. And it means we need to do further testing. So it's all intricately linked to the, to the parent. Um, but for the audience, I want people to know that we do have these structured tools that we use to really look at development besides just the general um, feel in a visit. Um, Blythe, can I, can I flip that around a bit? Um, and yeah. I've, talked to, I've talked about this before, um, where you have families such as ours that aren't looking for all of the interventions. And one of the things that I've talked about in Grand Rounds and in other examples is we were very, very, very slow to come around to getting a feeding tube for our daughter. And at no point at all um, did I feel any pressure from Christy or from Jill. Um, so in some ways, you know, we were the non-compliant or not adherent parent in terms of what you were supposed to do. But because they knew what our values were, so we weren't the, we weren't the anxious parent. In fact, I would say we were we've been very very cautious just because you have the particular technology or the procedure that doesn't mean you should do it, and that's been sort of our default. 
Um, and that was, you know, so I think there, it, it just goes back to the, the relationship piece that we've been talking about, but, um, I think there's other examples where it's not necessarily that the, you know, the family is looking anxious and that is, that is a challenge, I think, for, for pediatricians, but you could also say it's equally a challenge when you see something that that child or family should clearly do and would make their life better and that family isn't on board. Um, and, you know, so, and, and again, it wasn't a one-off um, conversation. We had many conversations about whether or not we get a, a G2 for our daughter and we ended up doing that and the quality of her life has been much better. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's another, you know, just example of being eternally grateful of, of walking alongside, as Christy said, as opposed to like dragging us or um, along for the ride. As far as um, kind of like the parental anxiety, I, I will say that it did help us a lot. Um, just that Dr. Kaufman took all of our concerns seriously. So the things that ended up not being a big issue, um, she listened to them with the same care and compassion that she listened to the, the issues that ended up becoming a larger issue. Um, both Sam and I've had uh, poor experiences with adult medicine um, with ourselves going in for an issue and, oh, well, if it's bad in a week still, then come back again, otherwise, eh. Um, and, you know, we've, we've never had that experience with our son Atticus, thankfully, um, because he's had an amazing care team. Mm -hmm. um, but just, just knowing that we were listened to um, really helped our anxiety, um, both for big issues and small. Sarah, thank you, Roman. Sarah, how, how about that? Sort of bringing the, emo this is the last thing, and then we're gonna open it up to see if any of our guests, um, guests who've joined us have questions. But Sarah, is there anything you would add about sort of the emotional acts, feeling comfortable mm -hmm. or not? Um, with your bringing your emotion into those meetings? Um, I think we always felt comfortable. And I think we already touched on just the, and a lot of people have touched on it, the regular meetings. So it's not always those big conversations. I think that allows um, a lot of things to happen organically and it allows you to kind of build that trust and build that relationship. And everyone's already touched on that. Um, and then, you know, the feeling like your family and your child is seen as a whole person and not just their disease that's being treated or not treated or analyzed or whatever, but they're a whole person and your family is looked at that way. Um, and then something I would add is that, um, I know this can be a little bit maybe tricky sometimes, but I think that something I appreciated from Dr. Monahan and from other um, providers we had was when they showed emotion. I think that you hear a lot about doctors aren't supposed to be emotional or, I mean, I've heard other people say that. I don't know if that's something that's that's taught at medical school, but um, I think that of course you can't, you know, there's times where it's, um, it's always tricky, you know, when's the right time to be emotional or not, but there are a couple of conversations, um, you know, our, our conversation when we decided to enroll in hospice, we were at the hospital and we had the whole care team. And there were a number of people in that room, providers who were crying. And for us, that was so comforting. And that was that allowed us to feel, it just allowed us um, to feel like we we're all humans together in a room um, where something really big was happening and something really emotional and something really um, just big. And so I just, that, that human side of it, I know it's tricky. You, can, you have to you know, have those boundaries and have those, um, you know, sort of lines, but I think that that, that human piece of it um, really meant a lot to us. I, I, I love that and I agree completely because we're human beings first and we share that, we share that. And it's not, this is not the, 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 the most important part of caring for anybody and certainly children and certainly children who are sick is not the technical stuff. It's all the relational piece, which is the what part of your heart and your head are you bringing to this? Um, and maybe that, that might be hard to open yourself up as a doctor to what's happening. Maybe, I mean, parents can't help themselves. Like that's just like, that's what we do as parents. But as in a professional capacity, maybe that's 
harder to do. Um, uh, we, you could talk about that. Oh, um, so we have Lori wrote, I, I think it's Lori, as a nurse, yeah, and one involved in palliative and bereavement work in peds, I believe emotions are important. They provide the human connection with one caveat, as long as the family isn't having to pick us up off the floor. Yes, and I wear waterproof mascara for a reason. Thank you to all of you for sharing. Yes, it is not, it's nobody's job to pick somebody else off the floor. We all have to keep our act together, even as we're showing our, I mean, not keep our act together, but hold ourselves together, even as we are also showing our full selves. Um, do we have uh, any other, do any of the part, any of the guests who are here want to ask a question? You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, I think, Kim, are you going to ask a question? Okay, go for it. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Matthews, and I am a staff member of the Ohio Department of Health. My role at ODH is parent consultant. And um, in my role, I serve many families of, with, that have children with medical handicaps. And I myself am a parent of a child with a special health care need. And my spouse also um, had a special health care need, and he passed in May of last year. And I am so thankful that I tuned in this afternoon because I have taken quite a few notes and a lot of the work that we're doing at the Department of Health right now centers around how can we better support families and better help meet their needs. So I just wanna say thank you to all the families who were um, so willing to share your stories and to be vulnerable and help us better understand your lived experiences, as well as I want to say thank you to the providers the, the, and the physicians and um, the care managers for being so willing to share what that's like for you, because um, it takes all of us working together and um, to meet the family's needs and to have that heart of compassion to know that it's okay to show that emotion and to let them know that they are never alone. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And I'm gonna, we're gonna send out this recording of this and I hope you will share it far and wide with your colleagues in the state of Ohio. Um, please, I hope you will. Um, I sure will, thank you. Anybody else? I see you, I see you, Lee, I'm, I'm not, don't want to put you well here I am putting Lee on the spot because um do you I, I think you your child is recently diagnosed right yeah we have uh Lori and I our our second kid was recent well recently <laughs> feels like a million years but it's been this last August was diagnosed with cannabis disease yeah and, and do you have do you are you feeling supported well supported by your child's pediatrician yes our pediatrician is great um I, the care coordination has been you know Lori and i have been chatting a little bit as we're hearing all of you for sharing thank you for sharing everyone um i don't think the 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 care coordination has not been i think what we think it what we want it to be, what we feel like we need it to be. But our pediatrician herself is fantastic. Um, but we're, we're working on that on our end. There's just a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of different things to, that we have to learn and go to and deal with and yeah. Yeah, it makes you think you kind of wish that legislators who are in charge of the compensation policies that make these things possible or not possible and in sh private payers that everybody would spend a week in your shoes and then see what might change. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, as a lobbyist, I definitely feel that way. So yes. Ah. <laughs> um, anybody else, any of our other guests here, give you a chance if you wanna say anything or ask anything. No. All right, well, we're at the end of our hour together. Do any of our guests, uh, any of the pediatricians or the parents have anything else they wanna say 
uh, either to pediatricians who will, might be listening to this or fellow parents who would be listening to this. Anything else? I'll just put a shout out that, you know, we are all in this together and um, happy to talk with anyone who uh, uh, wants to talk about this role uh, as a pediatrician. Um, it's one of the, the, the highlights is being able to pass on all this gray hair worth of knowledge that we've got, gotten over the years. So, yeah. Courageous Parents Network does have a, a, a a short little piece for the primary care pediatrician who's wondering how to do this. Um, and lots of videos of parents talking about the importance of their child's primary care pediatrician, including Sarah. And so uh, we'll include a link to those as well in the event that these are resources that you can want to sh share um, to colleagues or to fellow families to just be inspiration for the for what this, for inspiration, for what families, what you can ask for and seek in your child's um, pediatric team, whether they're actually your child's pediatrician or they're a specialist who becomes the quarterback, what you can expect, that level of support, listening, validation, um, and coordination and pediatricians. So you can feel that you are supported and what a difference your role makes for families. Um, thank you very, very, very much, all of you, for your time today, um, and just with great gratitude for the work you do um, in your advocacy as parents and as your advocacy as doctors and nurses and care coordinators and human beings. We are very grateful. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.